well, at our recent meeting, we have discussed the laparoscopy, the proposed laparoscopy and hysteroscopy course uh, for HSD trainees with the uh, Royal College of Physicians. I said I'd just fluff out a little bit more some of the issues that we have uh, discussed and I've also sent along um, elements of the curriculum uh, that you might want to circulate to proposed uh, steering committee members. So we know that there are contemporary challenges with respect to training our uh, surgical trainees now. The European Working Time Directive is severely impacted on that, as has the overall number of trainees, which has risen uh, to almost double in the last 20 years. Also, this is not, their training is not aided by the fact that there's been an introduction of new technology into the surgical space. Um, and also there's a, a diminishing experience of trainers themselves. In the past, we had highly experienced consultants. Now, ex consultants are of less surgical experience. And of course, there's a high attrition rate with respect to our trainees uh, heading off to parts foreign. Now, there is an expectation uh, through the Institute uh, and the College of Physicians that all our higher specialist trainees should have a baseline uh, skills level and non-technical skills level with respect to uh, the, their knowledge base. Now, when looking at laparoscopy and hysteroscopy, it has been prescribed within the curriculum what they should and shouldn't know. And I think there is um, a sort of an aspirational element to this, and I might go through that uh, if I could. Looking within the curriculum uh, for HSD trainees in obstetrics and gynecology, uh, the section that relates to uh, laparoscopic benign abdominal surgery does highlight uh, some of the non-technical and technical skills that are required um, and, you know, you can see here on this slide that, you know, of course we need them to know their anatomy. Uh, we do and should need them to understand equipment and theater setup, uh, energy sources that they use and, and other sort of aspects to, uh, uh, to laparoscopic surgery. But some of the things that are discussed within the skill set and how they're assessed via OSATs is not what we'll be doing through this course. And the course, I think, will be slightly different. And we have elements here, for example, like the performance of laparoscopic suturing. That is highly aspirational within the context of the course we will be offering. Um, so, you know, we need to just be careful and we possibly need to change the curriculum in step with what the course uh, will be offering. Uh, and there's other sort of uh, things here, like the uh, excision and ablation of peritoneal endometriosis and ovarian endometriomas. Now, that's quite a complex uh, skill set to have. And also proficiency in laparoscopically assisted vaginal hysterectomy and laparoscopic hysterectomy. Again, uh, I don't think at the end of HSD training we'd expect our trainees to be able to do this. And that's also sort of highlighted here that we're expecting them to have, you know, a minimum of 10 excisions of uh, peritoneal and ovarian endometriosis. That now is quite aspirational and it is quite difficult to get a, a set of skills and a set of procedures for them to have mastered. Also, the hysterectomy, I would expect very few of any of our trainees coming off the training programs uh, to have uh, the ability to perform laparoscopic hysterectomy um, when so few consultants are actually doing it. Um, then looking at hysteroscopy, it's divided into two sections. One is the outpatient um, hysteroscopy uh, issue, and I think we should have a focus on the course at developing outpatient hysteroscopy nationally. Uh, and then with respect to what surgery they can do hysteroscopically, again, we should limit ourselves to maybe biopsy and uh, the management of simple polyps uh, and intrauterine uh, adhesions. Uh, uh, the HST curriculum as it currently stands talks about the use of or it talks about the ability to be able to use for example a Collins knife uh, I'm sure most trainees don't even know what that will be uh, also transcervical resection of fibroids um, and of the endometrium again probably outdated in its in its aspiration but certainly something um, that we shouldn't be encouraging necessarily our trainees, and that's more advanced, uh, I think, in its nature. But uh, second generation endometrial ablation needs to be performed. 
And again, we've just got to be careful with the curriculum here, and we might have to go back to it to uh, rewrite it a little bit with respect to what we're going to be offering on this course. So there are minimal non-technical standards that will be uh, dealt with on the course. For example, hysteroscopy, you know, the equipment, the setting up of a hysteroscopy clinic. And I think it'll be important to partner with some people um, who run outpatient hysteroscopy clinics uh, and also the companies that provide the hysteroscopic equipment. Uh, and I think we need to partner and talk to them. Laparoscopy, again, some non-technical things about consent, patient preparation, the anesthesia for, um, electrosurgical safety, complications and dealing with things that we can provide lectures uh, to deal with. And that's uh, going to be part of the curriculum that I have sent along with this. So what do we require uh, from a technical point of view that somebody completing um, their, their specialist training, what should they be able to do? Well, they should be able to do a diagnostic laparoscopy at a minimum. They should also be able to provide uh, sterilization uh, to patients requesting it. They should be able to, to perform a salpingectomy and this will become more important I think with the recent knowledge that much uh, uh, about two-thirds of ovarian cancers probably are, are tubal in origin so we'll probably be removing more tubes going forward. Certainly uh, a trainee coming off a training program should be able to perform an ectopic pregnancy. They should also be able to look after simple ovarian cysts. Uh, some larger cysts like dermoids and endometriomas can be quite complex and difficult to deal with, but simple ovarian cysts certainly should be well within the remit uh, from a technical point of view for most of our trainees. Simple adhesiolysis and also understanding and having ability to perform the skills for at least two entry techniques. Hysteroscopy, when we look at the technical skills uh, required, our trainees finishing their training should be able to perform office or outpatient hysteroscopy. They should have a familiarity with a variety of endometrial biopsy techniques, but certainly techniques through the hysteroscope. They should be able to perform second generation endometrial ablations and probably polypectin with scissors. Um, getting exposure to resecting fibroids and also resecting uh, intrauterine septums uh, maybe or septa should be a pro could be problematic. Um, so I think offering it as part of this current offering, I don't think it would be smart. So the course, it's proposed that it's going to be six months long. It's primarily skills-based. And we need to move away from the thinking that this is all going to be lectures and things like that. And this is going to be a skills-based program. Um, there's, it's going to be proficiency-based learning and assessment. So there will be um, targets to set and hurdles to pass for our trainees before advancing through and completing this course. Uh, the proposal is that it's two modules, basically um, a basic and intermediate set of, of, of skills. There will be three face-to-face -face simulation and lecture days. They will take their simulators home um, and when they come back they will be assessed on the skills that they've become proficient in. And also there will be the backup of a virtual learning environment um, and Moodle is probably the simplest one for doing that. So the steps that I see kind of needing to, we need to jump through or go through will be that the steering committee will agree a curriculum, will appoint a faculty and possibly we'll need to engage with industry because um, delivery of the course, that one of the concepts I think we need to, to sort of engender will be that they get a familiarity with of all equipment that they may face in the various hospitals around the state and outside the state as well if they go to work in other, other countries. So we should really engage with industry at an early point and uh, by having engagement with them um, we they will get, get our trainees exposed to their equipment. When the faculty gets appointed, the faculty will agree the technical aspects of the content delivery um, and uh, that's quite important because one of the things that you did mention at our meeting was that you know that, that you might go with a certain simulator, that simulator will not be able to deliver this content, uh, especially when we get into the procedural side of things. They cannot, um, you cannot perform cystectomies and oophorectomies and appendicectomies. So we'll need to get the faculty to agree on, on, on how we best to develop and deliver the technical side of this. There will be a rotational faculty. So, you know, we need by, by getting the interested parties together um, so that people don't fatigue from, from delivering this kind of course, that there will be a rotational element uh, to the faculty. And from the Institute's point of view, um, you know, it's important that this gets integrated into the HST program and that 
uh, the curriculum does change accordingly. Uh, there is a question mark whether the Medical Council needs to approve a, a fundamental shift like this because uh, a simulator-based program, uh, to the best of my knowledge, doesn't really exist and the Medical Council may need to approve it. And also by uh, maybe kind of informing the RCOG because a lot of our trainees do the MRCOG. There is a requirement now that they have the core curriculum uh, completed and uh, as to whether you know the Institute and the College of Physicians need to to discuss this with the RCOG. So some things I was thinking about, things that need to consider, we do need to probably have a train the trainers program. So when a faculty gets appointed, um, from the point of view of consistency, etc., we should have a uh, training program. The question also, our training, train the trainers program. The, there possibly needs to be a catch up program uh, because I'm sure some trainees will feel that they feel a bit left out because they haven't been able to engage in this program, or it could be a line in the sand, but I think having some catch-up program from those already in program or completing program would be no, no harm. Uh, as I said, we do need to have simulators appropriate to this course, and I always kind of state, I personally have a, a commercial uh, interest in this, but that's purely because I understand this space and have designed a simulator that is, a, you know, will deliver uh, on all aspects. Uh, we need to consider that there will be a consumables and an ongoing consumable element to the courses as they uh, go forward but some of these consumables the trainees should be able to get for themselves and we need to understand you know that that they can and, and can't do this and whether the college supplies or the institute supplies some of this stuff we need to also agree there's a proficiency standard with this and with respect to certification um, and that's something that we need to fluff out a little bit because we need to consider those that may not reach that that standard um, but I think what I've noticed over the years running courses is that with training most people can reach uh, a minimum standard uh, but I think we do need to, to, to have a process uh, for either remediation or worse if somebody cannot be remediated with respect to these skills so hopefully this course will um, be of, of, of major use to our trainees, uh, major benefit to our patients, but it is a fundamental shift in our thinking with respect to training. And I've been running these courses for many years now um, and found them very, very useful. But I think the Institute and the college are being very brave uh, and very forward thinking in introducing a mandatory program. Uh, and hopefully this is something that might be used as a model and a template elsewhere. So thanks very much for your attention. I look forward now to getting together with the steering committee um, and then faculty uh, to deliver this program. Thank you very much.